The apostle here is uh, calling to our remembrance the manner of our entrance. And he's, he's affirming that there really never is any change of direction from where we were placed when we were put in Christ. That the life that we're given in our initial entrance into the kingdom, although undeveloped in respect to spiritual maturity, is nevertheless the very same life in which we now presently continue. I, I appreciate the perspective that our uh, brother Boyce often reminds us of, that the, the parallel of the DNA that exists in our, in our current bodies, that we're born with this spiritual DNA, so to speak, that all, all the spiritual advantages that are required for us to grow up into Christ in all things, they're, they're given to us in this seed form in our birth in Christ. It is from this stance that all of our things are worked out in us to, to root us and ground us. I was reminded um, of Galatians in the third chapter when he when he, he tells them, "O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? This only what I learn of you: received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, or are you made now made perfect by the flesh? The, 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 the same way in which you entered, that's the way in, in which you continue. So, I um." I asked myself the question as I, was, uh, as I was going through this, how did we receive Christ? Well, first of all, we received Christ by faith. Yeah. Whenever we received Christ, we did so wholly convinced of and wholly dependent upon the provision of salvation that's provided in him. Uh, we were confident in that hour that he was not only able to save our soul, but we had an awareness that he was willing to do so as well. When we were baptized, we responded in faith to this, this promise of God and, and that, that Christ would wash away our sins because of the death of Christ on our behalf. And, and we anticipated our acceptance before him. And when we came to Christ, we were accepted on the basis of this faith, uh, on this reliance of God, what God did in Jesus Christ. Now we realize that we have not earned our salvation, that it was given to us of God. A faith comes. This is a, a, the free gift is what he calls it in, in uh, Romans there. And we continue in that confidence that he that has begun a good work in you is able and, and willing to perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. That's the reason why whenever people em emphasize too much your choice, that, that has a tendency, you lose confidence in that. Because if it's, if it's entirely up to me to continue to choose to walk in Christ Jesus, well, then I, I, I have a problem. Because uh, I, I have faith in the, the fact that God put me in Christ, that he chose me before the foundation of the world. That's where my confidence lies, that, that it's a work of God in me. And also, we, we received Christ in humility, um, we received Christ without any sense of self-righteousness or self-worth. There, there was no haughtiness with us re receiving Christ. We didn't receive him in guile or receive him with some kind of hidden agenda. Anyone who has e ever genuinely come to the Lord Jesus doesn't come to him with ulterior motives. And, and no one comes to the Lord, also no one comes to the Lord to make a deal with him. Yeah. Uh, they receive him and they acknowledge him as their only source of salvation and they surrender themselves to him on his terms. We don't come to God on our own terms. And, and just as this is true in the beginning, this is the manner in which we continue in him. We follow in the footsteps of our Savior. When it's not, not my will, but thine be done. We, we are conformed to his, his will. Now, there are also some things that were accompanied with our entrance into Christ Jesus. Um, just for the purpose of summarizing this, I wanted to use Colossians in the second chapter, verses 9 through 11. Um, this is right after the text that we're um, speaking out of. And whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. That's, that's one thing that accompanied your entrance into him. When we came to him, we were granted this, this spiritual operation, so to speak, of the cutting off of the flesh. This is something that we couldn't, we couldn't accomplish on our own. There was an actual spiritual separation that was um, uh, accomplished between ourselves and our flesh. However, the separation that we're talking about here, it's, it's one that's very specific in its nature. Your flesh isn't eliminated. Your flesh isn't destroyed. Um, you are not completely rid of it, but you are disassociated with it in identity and in nature. You're like transplanted out of that, that nature. 
And this separation in identity and deliverance from bondage is one that has to be continued in. This is the way that Paul speaks of it in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. Uh, we, we understand that this has happened. The old man's been cut off, off from us, but this is something we have to, we have to continue, and we got to put them off, which is co- corrupt according to the deceitful us. And secondly, on the other side of this, not only were we delivered from the old, but we were given a new mind, renewed affections. We were made a new creature in Christ Jesus. Uh, the, the, uh, right after the text we just read there in Colossians, put off the old man with the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So when you, you came into Christ, you were made righteous. You were made a new creature. And this, this is a distinction that has to be made. You weren't just considered to be righteous on the merit of Christ. So this is something that's, that's rampant in our day. But this is very, very important because it has serious implications concerning the rest of your life here on the earth after your conversion. You don't continue as a sinful man whose sin was written off. You can t- continue as one who was forgiven and then made actually in truth to be righteous. You were, you were made that. Jesus didn't die so that God could pretend that men were okay. That's, that's, God's not pretending. You are righteous. That's something that you were made. Uh, we, are, we, have an experience, we have this experientially, be able to, to experience that we do have renewed affections, that we do want the right thing, that, that the, the things that were once pleasurable to us, we actually don't want those things anymore. So then he continues here, uh, walk in him, and he he, um, continues by telling us the manner of our walking in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. And uh, first of all, he says rooted in him. Now, until this last week, I never really considered the, this aspect of this phrase. I'd always considered when, you, when you're talking about rooted, that that means immovable. Like, like a, a well-grown tree whose roots are so deep and wide that it, it can hardly be removed. It's, it's stout. But even more than this, we have to be rooted in the right place. We, we must put our roots in the place where we will get what is beneficial to our growth. Uh, roots are a part of the plant that absorb, absorb moisture and, and the vital nutrients into it, that the things that are crucial to the growth of the plant. And, and we must put our roots in the right place where we know that, that, that there's water. And men are in some ways like roots and that whatever we are most close to, we will absorb. We're like a spiritual sponge, so to speak. And depending upon what we've been feeding on, we will either grow or will wither. So the exhortation here then is to stretch out, as it were, your spiritual roots and put them in the place where you know that there's water and there's nutrients. If you're occupied with, and, and this is another thing, if, if, if your occupation is to seek to drive deep your roots so that you'll be able to absorb most of what God has provided for you in Christ Jesus, it'll, it'll have this stabilizing effect on your spirit. I, I think we've all um, been able to fellowship in the truth of this, that when you're occupied primarily with obtaining, then it'll actually be more difficult for you to be drawn away with lesser things. As you're obtaining, as you're, you're, you're taking hold of these things in Christ Jesus, the, the, the temptations that would otherwise be, be more alluring to you, you're, you're able more easily to just to cast these things off. So then you're rooted and built up in him. Now, I've often said that um, when we're given in, what we're given in Christ when we're born again is not a one-time thing, and it has to be maintained. And this is true in certain aspects, especially how we consider, as I just mentioned, that we're going to, we need to maintain the separation we've been granted from our sinful nature. And, um, but there's more, even more to be seen in this. We have to actually increase in our sanctity. We, we, not only do we have to maintain it, but we have to move f- further away from the world and become more engaged in the kingdom. These, yeah. these things have to be continued yeah. in and increased. Yeah. And a, as it concerns the new life that we've been given, it may sound like an oversimplification, but uh, it is the natural course of those who've been given life to live. Yeah. Life makes us live. Yeah. That's what life does, right? 
So if, if a woman gives birth to a perfectly healthy child, there's nothing wrong with him. There's nothing wrong with his organs. He has eyes to see. He has, he has uh, lungs to breathe. He has a heart to, to beat blood. If that heart never works, if he never opens his eyes, if he never breathes in a breath, and in what way is he alive? Uh, uh, life is not a stagnant entity. Uh, life is by its very nature um, uh, it's something that causes someone to grow and to increase. It, it has to have this activity. Life animates us. Uh, as it concerns being built up, we, we notice in our text that it says built up in him. Now, this is the reason why we uh, emphasize edification in our meetings and our interactions with one another, because this is the direction in, into which all these things are headed, that we, we will be fully conformed into the image of Christ. Now, on an individual level, this is a, a high priority. This is like the first priority is, is moving on to perfection, glorifying God, and, and you being more conformed into the image of Christ. However, that being said, as, as we walk on our pathway, uh, as we walk in the faith, we must see ourselves primarily not as an individual, but as a part of the building, a part of the, 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 the church growth project, so to speak, of administrated by the Lord Jesus Christ. Being built up in him is, as it were, a group activity. This is something that we, we all participate in together. Um, my, my, me increasing in the faith and growing, it actually helps you to grow as, as, you, as you see me. And then as, as you respond to me and encourage me, it also encourages you as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a group activity. This is the way in which we walk as a member of the body. We, we see ourselves as, as this identity, as a part of the bride of Christ, as, as lively stones that have a place in the future habitation of God and the Spirit. So rooted in him and, and built up in him and established in the faith. Now all, our, our faith, although it never changes in its nature, it does in fact increase as we grow up into him. There, there is such a thing as weak faith and there's such a thing as being full of faith. Remember, it said Stephen was full of faith. Uh, this might seem like a foreign concept in the, in the um, church of our day. I'm, I'm sure you've heard many times about how a little bit of faith can do a whole lot. You know, if you just have this much faith, you can, you can do a whole lot. And I, actually, it's popular nowadays to say it's okay to have doubts. That doubt is actually the aspect of faith. But this is not how we're, we're, we're taught to speak concerning faith. Faith is something to be established in. It's something to grow up in. As, as we continue in the faith, we grow in our persuasion of the truth. That's, that's the, 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 the nature of faith. And I'm, I'm sure that you can testify to this. As, as we grow, we're actually called to works that require more faith. There are times when the Lord brings us through a circumstance that requires more faith than we had before it came to us. These times, they're like a call to, to greater heights. They're, they're, we're called to trust the Lord more. There are times that the Lord will do this. I, I want you to trust me more, and he'll, he'll give you this, this circumstance. Now, when times such as these come, uh, we'll be equipped to meet them if we've lived a life like this, a, a waging war upon doubt and unbelief. If we've used what the Lord has given unto us, then, then we, we will be granted more. He will give us an increase in this. Now, this is an, this is an encouraging prospect. This is something that I was uh, uh, gloried in in seeing this, that you can, in fact, endure more than you did yesterday. You can. The, the, the same God who delivered faith unto you can cause you to be established in it and to, to increase and abound in the faith. So then he continues and he says, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Now, this is an affirmation of the joy that comes from abounding in spiritual growth. The joy of the Lord is not something that can be successfully manufactured by half-hearted and disobedient people. This is not something you can accomplish by heeding to a, a, a commandment. Uh, he, he's not saying, well, you better be thankful or, you know, you'd better start rejoicing in the Lord. This is not, this is not the way that this comes about. Uh, rejoice in the Lord, I say rejoice. You know, that's, that's not how it comes. Uh, really, this is not something for us, us to do as much as it is a product of maintaining spiritual perspective. Uh, there are a great many things that happen in our lives that could cause for us to be unthankful if we look at the things only that are seen. Uh, however, if we're able to see the Lord working in and among us, we will be able to give thanks in all things. If, if we can perceive what... Um, if we can perceive what God is doing, the things that may seem to be a disadvantage to us in the present, we can see that it's, it's working for us something far greater. 
Uh, although we may not be suffering persecution in the same capacity as the apostle did when he uh, testified of this in his epistle to the Corinthians, we can fellowship in these words in this anticipation for our light affliction. That's, that's all it is, brethren, is a light affliction comparatively, which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That's, that's an, an excellent statement. So then... He continues, beware of being spoiled. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Now, I know from personal experience that this is more than possible. And in and, and fact, that this is inevitable if men are not built up and rooted. Yeah, right. uh, as of late, I've, I've actually witnessed it happen to my own brother in the flesh, Andrew. I, I had spoken to him sometime about a year ago, and he he told me he thanked me for everything I'd ever told him. And I seen I saw pictures of his baptism on the internet, and he was he was zealous for about five minutes, and then I I, I got a message from him not too long ago. You brother know about his attempted suicide, and and whenever I talked to him, he was you could tell that that at some point in time something entered in. He's he's waxed philosophical. You can tell by the way that he talked. And this is an example of one who didn't do what our text today exhorts us to do. So this, the reason, this is the reason why this happened, because he didn't sink his roots deep into the provision of what God provided for him to grow. He didn't see himself as a, a part of the body of Christ, and most importantly, he didn't continue to rely upon the Lord for the sustaining of his faith. He did not continue in the will of God. Every person that this has ever happened to, somewhere, at some point, he began to exalt his own opinion and his own will above that of the Lord. Yeah. Philosophy is like a cancer of the mind. It, yeah. it, it spoils a man. It does. I, 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 I thought about this. Satan was like the author of philosophy, if you want to think of it that way. Right? See, he actually caused Eve to think of the fruit on that tree as something other than what God said it was. Yeah. God said it's forbidden. Yeah. That's how you're supposed to think of that fruit. But he, he made her think of it in a different way. Yeah. So whenever we have too much confidence in our own mental capacities concerning the issues of life, things that, that we know nothing of, really, other than our current experience in the world, which is very minimal, as soon as we rely upon our own wisdom rather than that which comes from God, it begins to permeate our entire thinking process. Sound reasoning always begins from the correct perspective. It, it, it's true that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This is the truth. If a man does not approach Scripture as it is the truth of God, the Word of God, and therefore authoritative over, over all opinions of men, then he's destined to fall. This is, this is the destiny of this man. If we don't first rely upon God for all of our understanding, there's really only one default. There's only a, one other thing you can, you can turn to. Now, um... Lastly, brethren, I want to finish by speaking a moment of what the apostle tells us directly after our text. Um, he says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Rooted and built up, he gives this warning, Beware, that it, lest any man spoil you. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. Amen. See, there's, there's nothing about your Lord and Savior and the salvation that is in him that is in any way inadequate or lacking to bring you to glory. All things that are needed for you to grow up into him, to be built up into the body of Christ, to be rooted in him firmly, they're there for those who will seek them. The exhortation of our brother in the text this morning, in summary, is this. If you have received Christ, then take advantage of what he has provided for you. Don't allow anything to come in between you and your Lord. Don't let this, this deception enter in, because you are, if you are in him, you lack nothing that is required to make it from here to forever being with the Lord. Thank you.